Welcome to this bonus edition of Strange New Pod. I am your fleet admiral and host, Julian Brown, alongside Commander MC. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm very excited about this because I have worn Vulcan ears and painted myself green. So, Oh, well, yes, you have. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, as you could see on our view screen tonight, we are very delighted to be joined by Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard's lead creature and character designer, his work also goes very far beyond those series. Welcome, Neville Page. It is a just a blast to have you on. Thank you so much. I'm privileged to be here and excited to have this chat. Yeah, us too. Uh, I want to thank MC real quick for you guys met at San Diego Comic-Con and kind of helped get all this together. So yeah, just thank you, MC, and thank you again, oh, Neville, no for problem. doing it. Um, before we get started, we've been doing this at the top of each and every podcast, and we'll keep doing it until the strike's end and you know our writers and actors get what they deserve so this podcast was written and recorded during the 2023 wga and sag after strikes and without the labor of the writers and actors who work on the star trek series that we love and cover every single week um it wouldn't exist so we have to make sure that they're getting what they deserve gotta not go with this whole ai thing that the studios want it is just not okay so um yeah Pay your writers, pay your actors. Um, with that, Neville, again, a pleasure to have you. Um, we're really excited because we got our hands on this beautiful, yep. beautiful book. Uh, <laughs> it is the new book, Star Trek, The Art of Neville Page. And uh, before we get into it, we, we always like to ask our guests um, what your history is with Trek, right? Uh, were you a fan of the series growing up? I was. Um the original series as a child um i i i moved from the uk in 70 so uh, i'm sure we must have had star trek in the uk but uh, times were tough i think we had black and white tv if we were lucky back then but i stumbled upon it and uh was just so enthralled with that and space 1999 oh yeah uh, and, and Ultraman and Godzilla. And there was a variety of different television that when I was a child, I really, really loved. But I think it's fair to say that as a five-year-old, there was a lot of Star Trek going over my head. Yeah. Um, so I was enjoying it for different reasons. But then as I, as I grew up, I started to appreciate it more and more. And then as a, as a young man, uh, whatever age that would be, um, the next generation came out and a whole new love affair began uh, because the charisma of of Patrick Stewart I think was <laughs> the the biggest draw is, is him and uh and Jonathan Frakes you know the, the two of them and the rest of the cast are amazing as well but the two of them what they said and what they represented uh as male leadership which today matters a great deal in terms of our perspective of what male leadership uh, can be as an aspirational thing. You know, it, it's unfortunate that Patrick Stewart isn't our president or ruler yeah. of the world. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I think he'd be better at it. Um, but in, in any regard, these guys were saying things and doing things and presenting things written by amazing writers uh, that really resonated with me um, at the time in particular. So that those, those shows took hold of me and crafted not just my interest in the, uh, the franchise and the interest in science fiction, but interest in worldview, political view, because they are very political very. shows. Um, and I love that. And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't finding it. It may have been out there. I'm sure it was, but I wasn't finding it on TV. So for me, I have this wonderful recollection of ordering sushi on like Friday nights, having a glass of wine all by myself in my apartment and just, you know, you get your, your evening set up and it's just so, and you hit play and getting lost in, in Patrick or I should say Jean-Luc Picard. Um, but I had no anticipation or goal um, or fantasy delusion of ever working on these shows 
I was working as a toy designer at the time. Oh wow! And I was content in that world. I, I was a my background is industrial design, my education, and my work in toy design was based on industrial design processes and and so on. So for me, I was in a career and I was enjoying, which is important to say this, I was enjoying as a fan mm -hmm. uh, these shows. So through the course of time, I'm leap, leaping way ahead in time, getting the chance to work specifically on Picard was just like, it was really, really thrilling. And I've, I've had some incredibly wonderful opportunities in my career of people to work with and projects to work with. But Picard stood out only because of what I just said. Right. Was, Here, here's this character that means so much to, to me personally. And here's this guy, Patrick Stewart, that embodies it and getting a chance to you know, shake his hand and, and be in his presence. It was, how do you not fanboy? And there's a way to not fanboy, and that is to have this complete professional facade. But underneath, you know, I'm wearing Depends, and I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> but the inside, I'm like, ah! oh man, yeah, I, I love that you said that about TNG too, because uh, personally, TNG holds a very special place in my heart. It was my trek growing up, and yeah, uh, did a lot, did a lot for me. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so let's hop right into the book and talk about my favorite subject, which is the Kelvin verse. And, oh, that's uh, she will not stop talking about Kelvin. It's we love it. We love it. I get bleeped for mentioning Kelvin sometimes. every now and then. Every now and yeah. then. Uh, but specifically, the lobster monster from the Ice Planet, because mm -hmm. it's a very different creature than we've ever seen in Star Trek before. Usually, it's you know, you know, you know two arms, two legs, and a bumpy forehead, but this was something alien. <laughs> so what was it like designing that? Well, the challenge that J.J. Abrams presented to me, it was in the script, uh, a very early script, and it was described as it was on a desert planet, um, and it was described as bat-like and turtle-like. Uh, had multiple eyes, and I remember reading the script which I knew was a tentative script and it was going to change. So you try and um, temper your, your momentum of designing something to make sure that what you're designing is still relevant to the story. And I asked JJ if that's the design you want as written. And JJ is incredibly wonderful to work with because of his, one is just general demeanor and he's such a wonderful person, but his interest and willingness to have people collaborate and contribute outside of what he was even thinking. And I learned a lot personally from that and how valuable it is to uh, to involve all minds, um, not just designers. We don't we don't own um, the the vision of something. We we are able to communicate it because we should have the skills, drawing skills, whatever. So in that regard, we are we have the the good fortune of being able to sort of win in the uh, the presentation side of things but there's a lot of good ideas that are in people's minds that don't have those skills uh, and that's an important feature a director should have is to recognize that everyone can contribute and you as a director or a person who's asking for ideas must you must find a way to get those ideas out of people as opposed to saying, give me an idea. And if you can't draw it, then you, you don't have value. Um, and so obviously I'm, I'm, I'm gleaning a lot from that experience with JJ, mm -hmm. uh, but I've always felt that as a teacher for many, many years where each student reacts differently to an assignment reacts differently to criticism. And I'm talking about the positive criticism and reacts differently to the information being given. So you have to, as a teacher, uh, apply yourself to doing the best you can to get out of each individual uh, their best. So that's a big uh, commentary on um, <laughs> the lobster creature. <laughs> I warned you at the beginning of this that I was going to okay. ramble on. But JJ said, well, what else are you thinking? And I thought, oh, are, are you serious in that you'll let me sort of reimagine it? And so I asked him, I was careful. I was like, do you mind if I 
propose a different scene, mm. which is really presumptuous. And he's like, no, whatever you got. And again, that's the greatest thing about working with JJ and other directors that are of that like mind, where they're like, show it to me. I may not like it at all. I may not want it, um, but I'm open to it. So I came in with a storyboard idea of sort of a, a red herring where Kirk is being chased by something. Uh, that's the Polarilla. And you think that that's it until something busts through the ice and gets the Polarilla and then sees Kirk and now he's the target. And JJ welcomed that as an alternative. So then we talked about, because now there's the ice, the ice planet thing had already transitioned in the script from desert to ice. So I thought, okay, coming through, being in the ocean and coming through um, opens up an opportunity biologically to create something that will be different. It's on the, it's on, I won't call it land because it's just a sheet of ice, right. but it's on the surface and it can now run, but it's so massive. How is Kirk going to outrun it? Well, it's more of a lobster where it's meant to be underwater. Now, why I'm bringing this up and rationalizing is when I design anything, um, I, I truly do make a, a significant effort to have justified choices. So rather than JJ said he wants it to be big and red and have a lot of eyes on it. So that's those are my parameters. Big. Okay, if it's big, it has to be able to support its own weight, et cetera, et cetera. If it's red, why is it red? And the multiple eye thing, um, I have an opinion about, but that doesn't matter. Hmm. But we, I needed to answer JJ's uh, request of a specific that he wanted. So what I then do is I don't say what other people have said to me, which is a giant predator wouldn't be red. I could say that to the JJ. And if there's a real reason, then okay, we should have that conversation. But if that's what he wants, because that's the visual and that's he's got a goal uh, narratively and cinematically uh, that he wants to convey, then I embrace it and I figure out a way to justify it. So I remember having done all the justification, having figured out the biology, et cetera, et cetera, and we end up with the big red as you've seen it. And I was on a red carpet interview. And if this person is watching this, you know who you are, but it was it was a rather aggressive interrogation as to why would you have a predatory creature be red on a white planet, and you know my sometimes it's how you present a question that either um, makes you bristle. Um, I, I I I tend not to be upset about provocative questions because you know it, it's you have to understand where people are coming from, and I so appreciate the star trek community passion and uh how they personalize these things but my first answer to the question was it's an alien you don't know why i shouldn't know why it's red there's enough stuff on this planet where we look at it and go that's amazing and we actual scientists have no idea why it is that way or why it does that thing but secondly i did my research and the red choice was because in terms of qualifying it, JJ wanted it red, but I thought if you want it red, JJ, then I'm going to make this an underwater creature because the first thing a predator wants to be is stealthy. And the stealthiest color underwater is red because it's the first color to disappear at depth because of sunlight and its inability to penetrate and um, illuminate it. So I thought it was the greatest color. This is a creature who's now desperate because it's been hungry for so long that it's having to break through the ice and be in an environment. And because it's a fish out of water, for lack of a metaphor. That's how um, it, that's how it that's how it presented once it was on the ice yeah. and and chasing Kirk for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's it's clumsy and it's falling over and it can't quite catch him, which we needed. If this was a giant terrestrial creature, then there's no running that Kirk can do that would make sense. So anyhow, any design that one has, uh, whether it be a creature or or a prop or an object that is a consumable product you find at Target or something, you got to really know the information behind it, the reasons behind it, manufacturing processes, how this creature lives on this alien planet, what does it eat, 
et cetera, et cetera. So when you design teeth, dentition, um, how does it masticate? Is it a chewing process? Is it just a, a, a lunging, swallowing process like certain birds do? Those are the things that allow a designer to be creative because if you know the rules, you know a bit more about how far you can bend them but not have them break apart. Because if you don't know those rules, all of a sudden you put tiny little wings on a massive creature. Um, it feels wrong to the audience because like I said, the audience doesn't have to be a botanist or a scientist to know when something doesn't feel right. We're all humans who are biologically predisposed to understanding how nature should work. So you know, not why, but you know that it doesn't feel right. So that's the important thing about knowing how far you can push something to where it still feels right, but is conceptually, visually new. Yeah. So that the Big Red is one of my favorite characters I've ever had the chance to work on because it was kind of all of those things in one. Um, and the experience of working with JJ on it was just so incredibly pleasant. Well, it's also just like such a cool moment in the movie right because oh, yeah. it's it's, it it's it's very reminiscent in a, in a good way of of episode one of star wars when they're underwater and like mm -hmm. always, it's the, always a bigger fish moment but like yeah yeah exactly it comes up and it's just terrifying so yeah mm -hmm. love it. i absolutely love it yeah i definitely i was nerding out so hard in reading the book and hearing you at san diego talking about the biological justifications for a lot of stuff the listeners of the podcast know I am the headcanon queen. I am always <laughs> trying to find the reason why things yep. happen in the shows. So actually knowing that someone who is designing this stuff is putting that thought into it just meant the world to me. I wonder if that, that, you know, it's maybe strange to say, but I mean this completely. That is the greatest compliment uh, I can receive working on these shows and even if we fail i'll speak for myself even if i fail and i have um we do try yeah i do try uh there is no try <laughs> <laughs> we like star wars too yeah no yes, we're star here. wars fans too so. um but yes I, I i shouldn't have said that that was uh, an insult <laughs> but there there i sometimes believe that that is a that is a fantastic line and it's a fantastic philosophy. Sometimes it's, it doesn't matter that you tried, you just need to get through the finish line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the journey versus the destination, uh, the journey is so critical and in life and in the big picture, the journey is what matters. The destination will change on you. Mm -hmm. uh, the road is no longer there that you thought. So um, I thank you very much for that, that very nice compliment. Oh, of course. So to continue on with uh, Kelvin, we're also many of the hosts on the show are fans of the Romulans and in particular Nero. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. we love the story in the book about designing Nero and you asked Eric Bana to shave his head, but you ended up being the one to put the makeup on and you also had a role in the film. So yeah, the love you to talk about uh you know, redesigning the Romulans for the Kelvin movies and just the experience of getting into well, the it, Romulan makeup. I, I love the challenge of um, a simple design too, because, you know, I'm working on this major feature and I've just done the big red stuff. And that's very creative in regard to, you can do anything. Uh, and now it's a Romulan, which is just a few things you can play with, uh, namely the ears and the brow. Um, and then there's the cosmetic design of, you know, what is the hairstyle? I'm not involved with costume necessarily, but I'll propose some stuff. Uh, and then if there's embellishments like tattooing and piercing. So there's not like a whole bunch of sculptural things one can do with the Romulans, because then again, you're breaking the mold and it's no longer the Romulans. And we kind of did that with the Klingons in Discovery, which is a whole different conversation. But knowing the simplicity, it was kind of like, God, we, but we still need to bring something special to the table. So at the beginning, because it was a rogue group of Romulans, there was more of an opportunity to do something that was like a gang. Um, 
gang tattoos, gang piercings, that kind of thing. Scarification, even keloid scarring, if you're familiar with it, where you cut and it becomes a lump um, as opposed to just a, a scar cut. Yeah. They're designed scars. So I looked at a whole bunch of body modification reference um, things you would insert into the skin, things that look really uncomfortable to the average person who doesn't do that. Uh, and, but at the same time, I, I tr this is another thing I really do attempt to do. I'm very careful of is don't just do cliche and not because cl doing cliche is just lazy. Um, sometimes it's necessary because you want to communicate something quickly. So you may have to do a little bit of cliche. So you communicate it um, within the moment, but to to do things like uh tattoos or scars in, in particular that just say oh that's the bad guy because he has a scar um, that's a cliche and it's also not really nice to do technically yeah. in the world of things because i'm taking people who are into scarification body modification uh, i want to respect their choices and they're not doing it to be the bad guy they're doing it you know, same with tattoos you guys might have one or two yourselves. I don't know. Um, you know, and <laughs> tattoos, right. Tattoos to some people are seen as, um, this is all, you guys have lived it. It's, yep. it's negative to some and then positive to others. So what I don't like to do is do a tattoo and say, that's the bad guy. Cause they're tattooed. Cause then you're just, you're just continuing this BS perception of people that choose to do it. You have purple hair. Um, not everyone does that. Not everyone can. Um, and the, the thing that I don't like to do is do design characters <clears throat> and use things from real life that someone, one individual would find insulting. So I try and think of every choice and I might end up doing it, but I had, I had better own it and be able to answer for it and apologize for it or go, eh. I'm doing it for these reasons, and I uh, and that's just the way it worked out. So when I'm doing tattoos on the Romulans, I wanted to be very careful to not have it just be biker dudes, dudes or gangsters tatted up. So it needed to be culturally specific to the Romulans, to Eric Bana's group of guys and girls. Um, and so that whole thing was what JJ and I were talking about. We knew that Eric Bana was going to be Nero, but when he came into the trailer to meet with us, and I showed Eric some of the images and I remember him looking at him going, and this dude's a beautiful man with great hair and I've got hair envy clearly, <laughs> uh, or at least hair, hair respect. Um, and I said, would you mind looking like this? And he was like, shave my hair off down to the bone. Like, yeah, pretty much. And those contact lenses, I said, yep. And he said, well, why don't you do it? And I think he was joking, but I didn't know. And I thought, Fair enough. And I had a little more hair at the time, not much. So it wasn't like a stretch for me to do it, but it, it made me think, particularly when he left the trailer, I thought I really should do it because I'm asking someone to wear full scleral contact lenses, which are the ones that are big and cover the whites oh, of the eyes. Oh, wow. I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And I cannot stand the idea of anything on my eyes. Um, it horror, I, I've tried contact lenses and I cannot stand it. And I thought I should not be expecting other people to endure this when i have no idea what's involved so uh, i said to joel if you're comfortable with using me as a test subject because you'd have to hire someone to do a test on i'm about eric's general size um it sort of makes sense and i'm free essentially and i want to go through the experience so i went through the whole experience of life casting and all the steps you need to go through and that really has made such a uh, it, it has a profound impact on you as a designer because you know when you're using clay or ZBrush or whatever or pencil, every choice you make is something that you can kind of ex uh, uh, reference as an experience. I'm going to do a big foam forehead piece. Oh, that's just going to be ugh, all day long. Giant horns that go backwards. Well, that's going to be this all day long. And is it necessary? Does the design really warrant putting an actor through? Not the pain, because good makeup artists can figure out a solution that makes it comfortable, but it's still something you're going to do. Um, wearing the contact lenses was absolutely critical because just getting them in, oh, 
still mortifies me. But once it's in, it's easy. And that's why it's so valuable. Because now I could walk up to Eric in full makeup and say, this was easy. This was easy. Um, the contact lenses really scared the crap out of me. But you know what? I'm good with it. See, I can blink and I'm comfortable. Um, so when I, myself and Joel first went out to JJ to show him the test makeup, I guess we didn't tell him that I was in it. And so Joel's pointing at the scars and I'm just being quiet because Joel's presenting the makeup and JJ's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he's kind of like waiting. And he says, is, is Neville, is Neville going to be here? I'm like, I'm, I'm right, I'm right here. <laughs> he's like, what? What do you, Okay. Uh, and awesome. you know the downside is i don't get to look at myself in the makeup right. in front of jj and point at the same things but the upside sort of um outweighed that because of the experience of it and knowing what it's going to feel like for the actors and jj felt that this scar design was a bit too much for nero but he liked the makeup because the makeup was done really really well the sculpture the application the paint all that stuff by joel and his team um, so JJ said, well, let's have this be a character. You, you've done this to yourself now, Neville, cause you're going to be stuck in that makeup for several <laughs> hours, maybe for a couple of days. So I'm game. Uh, and then I was just going to be on set. And then for whatever reason, I was asked the question, Hey, do you mind if we give you a line? I'm like, sure. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that whole story was in itself, a, an amusing moment of all of a sudden now the camera's going to be paying attention to me uh and it was very unnerving and the thing that you don't want to do in makeup is sweat oh yeah, yeah. i was sweating bullets uh purely out of nerves <laughs> but it all worked out yeah oh that's awesome i i, I want to just follow up on that real quick because it's not in the book but did were you able like was was eric in front of you when you presented it too like do you do you know if like he appreciated you doing it or um, he wasn't in the first ones. Cause I don't think he was even in town. He came in, we did a life cast and all the things to prep. Right. Um, and then he was away for a bit. <clears throat> so we were presenting iterations of designs to JJ and the producers so that they were comfortable with the direction. Right. Cause we had a whole bunch of ideas of piercings, right. um, ways to braid hair, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when Eric did see it, I think he, I'm going to say it, but I might be wrong. He might have been jealous of this big scar because oh. it was such a cool look. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the, one of the greatest makeups ever, that was a simple makeup, was Tom Berenger in Platoon. That whole scar thing, I, I still yeah. looked at that as like, that was amazing. Um, so I think Eric was like, ah, oh, you got the scar. And I had, you know, one eye that was the dead eye. It was as cliche as it gets. Yeah. We're designing the bad guy. He has a scar and a dead eye. <laughs> Maybe we um, should do a cyborg glowing eye for the right, other side. Right, right. But in the end, um, uh, Eric, when he saw the, the finesse of his makeup and the tattoos in particular, I think he was quite pleased. And it was also a lot less right. time in the chair, which is important. But he was a trooper. We were all there late at night out in the open in the cold when we were doing the um uh the prison um uh, oh, the, the the deleted one the the klingon prison one yeah 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 and it was it was cold and we were basically in socks uh, our shoes were not really shoes they were more like slippers and we were on th this rock quarry and we had pickaxes i was with clifton collins it was a fun acting lesson uh because they pour, they had it was a concrete like parking lot basically set dressed to feel like you're in a prison and we're all breaking rocks and so the rocks that were poured out were only maybe this thick and underneath it was a concrete oh, parking wow. lot so i had my klingon pickaxe whatever that was and you know action give it all you got and i was giving it all i got and it was like a league ball hitting it with a bat with a loose grip each time cold outside and clifton was like dude dude <laughs> slow down you're you're supposed to be acting you're not really breaking stone i thought oh okay and that helped because uh i was i was basically wearing myself out in the first two takes 
not knowing that we were going to be doing it for 12 hours. Yeah. Oh man. That's why I'm not an actor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I appreciate giving it, giving it your all, man. I do. I do. <laughs> um, you talking about how earlier, how, how the Romulans are, you know, it, it, there's only so much that you can do. And I want to briefly talk about, um, Jayla because, um, it seems like it could be a simple makeup. Listen, I'm not a makeup artist. I, I don't know if it's simple or not. Um, I think you might have talked about it, but but the, the character design of Jayla from Star Trek Beyond is just so captivating. And I remember when we, you know, seeing her for the first time on the posters and like promotional material, it just like, it it's like the design sucks you in. It's like, I want to know everything there is to know about about that character. You know, it she was easy in a way in terms of why she's so successful visually. Um, the actress that performs the part, she's great. And she's a beautiful foundation to work on top of. So you've got that. Uh, and you don't want to, you don't want to, unless you're told to, you don't want to mess with the foundation. Um, but that makes things even harder in terms of like a really great makeup. The simpler it is, the more nuanced it is, uh, the harder it tends to be. Getting rid of eyebrows, for example, seems like how hard can that be? It's one of the hardest damn things. Same with like a bald yeah. kid. Hey, we're just going to get rid of the hair and the eyebrows. That's not hard. It's like, that's ours. And it takes such skill to really do a great job. So Jayla was sort of in that zone where it's like, yeah, we're going to be basically doing some kind of a bald cap to accommodate a wig. And we're going to get rid of her eyebrows because we're going to be doing this simple prosthetic. Where do you blend it? You know, where do you fit that in? Um, so whenever you're designing, no matter what it is, the conversations that you have creatively sort of need to be with the makeup artist first. You're given a direction, of course, via the script or the director or whomever's your boss. But once that direction has been described to you, the conversations are with you and the makeup artist because you need to design to what they um I shouldn't say are comfortable with, because that means like you're not challenging them or they're not challenging themselves, but you can't say, here's a design, good luck. And you've made it so expensive or you're just ignorant to it because you haven't thought about the ramifications of what that means. So having spent a lot of time listening to makeup artists, um, I, I, I make a concerted effort to hear them out first and understand the process, which is why going under the makeup is profoundly beneficial to both sides because now you're designing, you know, where to like stop a makeup. You don't just stop it here because you're just making it problematic for the makeup artist and then the DP and lighting and all these things. And then it's, you've designed a makeup, you, the designer designed a makeup that needs to be fixed in post. That's a bad design. So you work with your makeup artist first and that's how we went about Jayla, but she was, I knew that she, this is going to sound terribly arrogant, but I knew that she was going to be a successful looking character, A, because of who was wearing it, um, B, because the idea of doing something that is strong graphic design, nature tells you all the time that that works so well. It's kind of ironic that I've got a zebra behind me. Uh, yeah, if you think of, a, yeah, think yeah. of a donkey versus a zebra. The same proportion, they're horse-like, and they are similar proportions, but a zebra stands out because of the absolute starkness of black and white graphics. I didn't think to myself, oh, Jayla, she should be like a zebra. I just thought of strong graphics and black and a version of black and a version of white are what were chosen. And her graphic design is not terribly complex. It, it's classic line work that helps to... Um, showcase and, and accentuate certain cranial features. That was kind of it. And when I was doing it on, on paper, Photoshop, it was immediately apparent. I didn't have to do like I did on Nero, a thousand iterations. And I'm not kidding of variations on the graphics. It was like two or three. And I thought they, they all work because they're just strong graphically. And it's not because I'm a great, graphic designer it's just like graphics whether it be a poison dart frog a leopard a zebra graphics really bring so much to the table with design and then you don't have to have as much rubber glue to the face to communicate something new and innovative 
Yeah, I mean, she was new and innovative and a great character. So, yeah, no. Yeah, and a cool costume. You know, it, it yeah. all the whole worked. thing. Yeah, it was a great synergy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'd love to see her again in Kelvin Four when I it know happens. it. Whatever it happens, if it happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. never know. You never know. I'll never give up. I'm dying on that hill. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll see you there. <laughs> so we have to talk about the Klingons because you've designed them for Into Darkness and you also did it for uh, Discovery. So you've worked on them a lot. There's been controversy surrounding them. I Has personally there? always <laughs> loved the Klingons because uh, it's, it's always... Other than the TOS, there's always the same kind. There's always like an element of the Klingons in there. You can mm -hmm. always see the Klingons yes. in there. But there was so much in the book about, you know, designing the Klingons. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things is um, Brian Fuller wanting eyes in the back of the head. Yeah. On every design that you do, um, again, you're, you're given notes. This is what we're looking for. And sometimes you get notes where you're like, okay, that makes sense. I don't think you're asking enough of me. Um, I will give you an answer to your question, but I'm going to offer you three other versions that you didn't ask for. Um, and then there are notes that are, wow, you're asking something I'd never ask myself to do. And I disagree, but I'm obligated to provide the answer, or at least have the conversation um, first in disagreement. Because I think it's important that your value as an employee, not as a designer, but just as an employee, and most employers don't recognize this, by the way, but your value is to not just be a yes man. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be a constant pain in the ass by questioning uh, what you've been asked to do. But at the same time, you you are you have been hired to to think out of the box to. Um, to offer solutions that the client may not have considered. It's a tricky thing to know when to speak up because there are plenty of times when I've been asked, it's like, this is not the person that I'm going to go toe to toe with and say, I disagree. And, and the other thing too, is you have to recognize as an employee that there are many times when just, just answer their question. This isn't your movie. This isn't your vision. This is your privilege to work, to make money for what you do. And to be able to work on a, a project, which is a privileged gig to work on to begin with, as opposed to like making it personal. And I had an idea that was better than theirs. Like, eh, be thankful you've been given a job and you're working on their idea. That's, that's important to recognize. So, you know, how do you balance when you've been given a task that you don't agree with? And I, and I didn't agree with Brian on the eyes on the back of the head. Uh, so we had the conversation, you know, what is it you mean by that? Are you talking um, symbolically eyes on the back of their head or literally? And he, he said, literally. And I thought, okay. And I love Brian. Um, I have, I have a great relationship with him and it is okay that I didn't agree with that. So then what I felt my task was, is to show what he had asked for without biased and then possibly reveal that it uh to brian doesn't work or reveal to myself oh you know what i was wrong i really didn't think that that was going to work but you have to go through it and tr really try and make it work i like that challenge i truly do being asked to do something that i don't get and i don't agree with you know within reason hmm. and then you try it and it's like i made it work i think i made it work that one i couldn't get to work um <laughs> but what it did do and this is an important part about being open to ideas that go beyond what you had considered is if you're in a, a safe environment to think blue sky, to really push the envelope and not feel like if I throw something out there, someone's going to say, what a stupid idea. Uh, it's so important in a creative scenario to have at least a period of time. In, in in a room, a safe room, where anything goes, and you and everyone must not snicker at those ideas that are really seemingly daft, because from that idea you could go. You know what? That's not the way to go. But the fact that you presented it makes me think of this. 
which never would have existed. So we knew that our Klingons were going to be sans hair, shaved, whatever you want to call it, their version of Nair. And because of that, when Brian said eyes on the back of the head, I thought, what about extrasensory pits? So we, we've played with a variety of ridges. Maybe some of these ridges can have an exposed area that would be sensory pits like a python who has those open pits. And those pits go all the way to the back of the head and they have eyes on the back of the head. They can sense what's behind them. They're the ultimate predator. It would make sense. What doesn't make sense then when you're starting to like try and balance this out is like, why would they have so much hair covering all that sensoriness? Uh, and then you go, wow, but these guys are shaved because they are hyper aware. They are hyper at uh, in conflict all the time. So again, you, you, you play with the pros and cons, the, the validation of something, and, and you try and come up with justifications that don't feel too forced but I couldn't get that eyes, literal eyes on the back of the head to work morphologically. And I think I presented a case respectfully that this is why I, I cannot get it to work. Somebody else might be able to. And if you really want somebody able to, I'm not your guy. Cause I can't, I can't right. get it to work. Mm -hmm. um, but the Klingons in discovery um, went down a path that I think collectively we all felt like that's where we were pushing that wall. We're going to see how far we can. Oh, we broke it. <laughs> Some love the Klingons that we did. Some hate. Ooh, the personal messages I've received on those. Um, and I, and I hear them all. I read them all and I'm careful to read the negative as well as the positive because both can come from places that are um, have no foundation other than it's a personal point of view. But the Klingons that we did for Discovery, there was there was a lot of big ideas that we were playing with and a time frame, I think, that didn't allow us to truly um, refine them to the point where we would have had greater positive response. But the thing that always screws up a Klingon in terms of perception is when you don't have hair. And I've mm. known this since the mm. very first Klingons I've done, um, where I, th I, I think I proposed to JJ, wouldn't it be cool to see them without hair, um, head hair, because then we get to see all this extra stuff that we've not, well, other than Christopher Plummer and a few other things we've not really seen before. But um, the if you saw because we did kind of do it as well towards the end of discovery we added hair to our klingons yes they started to feel more and more klingon like and and few people would notice it's not unlike Worf in his first makeup on next generation to his final makeup on next generation it changed it changed mm -hmm. with technology and I'm, I'm never gonna like make excuses for our choices but what people tend not to know is the speed at which one has to move uh, in getting a thing done for a pilot, right. meaning a, a pilot yeah, episode, yeah. you end up with stuff that's like, eh, if given more time, it would be a little bit different or maybe a lot different. And if you look at Worf's first makeup and hair to second season, third season, it changes because like, hey, we can redo that makeup. We have the budget and the time to just finesse it a bit more. And that's what we were doing. Mary Chifo's uh, Laurel. Um, there was an opportunity to kind of go back and reduce the scale of her head and, and get it to just be more refined because we had more time and it got better and better, but I felt like personal redemption was Picard and Worf. Like, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. back to where we started. Right. Right. And um, I will also say that I'm not responsible for that makeup. It, the only thing I was responsible for, other than like some graphic design, choosing hair. Um, Are you talking um, about for Worf specifically in season three? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, that design that um, Vincent Van Dyke and his team did, that design, the conversation was just me confirming, yep, yeah. it needs to be what everyone expects it to be. And all we're bringing to the table is 
a different attention to the sculpture and uh, the finesse of the sculpture and the detailing and the technology of what we're running it in, latex versus silicone. Um, application techniques have changed. There's a few things, hair punching, all that. So it didn't need me going in and redesigning it. It just need me, needed me to say to Vincent, you're right, Vincent, hands off, uh, which is great. It says a lot about my Klingon ability. It's the best <laughs> the one I didn't do. Yeah. Except that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you gave me a nice segue into to Laurel. You brought Laurel up and how you're kind of able to go back to basics. Um, you also talk about in the book, like how you did your very best, right? Not to, not to sexualize the character, even though she does have, I think, one of the first, if not the first, like nude alien sex scenes in Star Trek. Um mm -hmm. But you wanted to make her powerful, which as a fan, like she's one of my favorite Star Trek characters. Um, oh, you definitely accomplished with that makeup, especially everything that was done to kind of update her in season two was just fantastic. What was it like creating Lorel and working with Mary Chivo? Because I know you go into some detail about that in the book. Well, the we had already set the tone for the Klingons, uh, good or bad, and then we get Mary cast as Laurel and she, Mary is a very unique looking woman to begin with. She it's almost like, ah, it's a shame to put makeup on her. Cause she's so, right. she's beautiful, mm -hmm. but cool looking. Um, and she is statuesque and she's just powerful in general. And then you throw in her, her skill set of just being an actor and her interest in really creating character um she was very invested in in that and, and we're not talking about like an actor who reads a great part of an existing human character she was invested in the fantasy and and the canon and the lore and all these things which is that's a whole different level of interest and commitment because you have to involve and weave in so many other things and i love that about mary in particular uh, but when it came time to design that makeup, um, it, it was it was critical that we get our Klingon look to work, but it had to work on Mary specifically. And so it meant treating certain things differently. You know, how big you make that brow. Uh, a female Klingon is, is a challenge in general if you're told, make them sexy. And whenever you're told that, the first thing I think of is, how important a man has to be in addressing that request because what is sexy um and and i i'd like to think of myself i certainly have effort into it um as being mindful and respectful of women and and the sexual uh the sexualizing of characters so all these things were like well we want to make this going on sexy and then we're going to have a sex scene it's like woof these are all tricky things um to do in general and i want to be careful i could i could make a misstep as a guy trying to imagine wearing those shoes so a smart thing to do would be ask the person who's going to be portraying it and i already had a great relationship with mary from the very beginning which was which was great because I felt comfortable in saying, "Hey, can we get together um, and discuss your character?" So we we did, and we, we were just talking about character in general because I was saying, "What do you like about your makeup so far? What don't you like about it?" Because we have an opportunity to evolve the makeup, and she was great in in participating with that. But then when the scene came up, I thought the person I can talk to our boss about it. But I really want to have Mary's perspective first. Then I'll talk to the boss and they can have comments on Mary's needs because she mattered most to me. Yes, the story matters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if she said something that was counter to the goal of the story, we'd have another conversation. But I wanted to make sure that Mary was comfortable with what we were asked to do. And this is, I know it's a podcast and I'll use medical terminology, but the fascinating thing about when you're asked to do a nude, um, and obviously we're talking about a woman, is the breasts. Because you're told we're going to show bare breasts. Okay, what kind? 
Like, well, two of them. What do you mean? What kind? Well, I mean, are we talking pendulous? Are we talking large, small, and that's relative, uh, wide set, high? There's, I think we know, a range of breasts to do. And a decision needs to be made. Someone needs to either tell me or you need to be okay with me proposing directions. And it's an odd conversation to start to have with anyone because usually it's just said and the artists, we start thinking about the specificity of these choices. And there's a lot of, well, not a lot of companies, but there's a few makeup companies that make breasts as a living. Mm -hmm. And they are thinking about this all day long. Uh, and again, not to sound crass, and it isn't crass, but when you're decide when you are proposing nipples, for example, there's a range to choose from size of areola, texture of areola, etc. And and I think it's we should all be comfortable in having these conversations anyhow, 100%. because mm -hmm. you know it it's, should not be taboo. Um, we can talk about breastfeeding for an hour. Um, because that's a whole other topic where I, I, I get very upset when people are so sensitive to a woman breastfeeding publicly because like, come on, puritanical issues, just let humans be humans. But I digress. Um, so it's a decision needed to be made about the breasts on this character, uh, as well as all sorts of other textures and so on. So that was the first conversation is being able to talk to a woman that I know well enough, but not well enough to say, let's talk about boobs. Um, but they're going to be your character's boobs. What do you think they should be? And let me show you Mary first before I pitch it to right. other people. And that's, that's the conversations we would have. And then we started talking about having sex. Um, what, what would a Klingon be like a female Klingon having uh, intimate relations with another Klingon or a human or a hybrid? How would you go about this? And, uh, again, you have to be mature enough to talk about it in a mature way, in a respectful way, in an open way. And you know, that's a testament, again, to Mary and, and maybe myself, that we can be that way with one another. That was our friendship. Um, and so, yeah, we, we strangely enough, had this conversation uh, in public at lunch, and I was showing her how... I thought a female Klingon would have sex and, you know, I'm doing all these moves and <laughs> talk about how there's the, these glands on the back of the head, which are pheromone glands. And maybe you could use those by rubbing them on and rubbing on your lover and people are looking at us. And no one, I think said, I'll have what he's having, but it was a <laughs> similar moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I. Uh so much that's like so much information and it all comes through it all comes through during yeah. that scene too right because it's it's aggressive too and we get a little bit of that in tng yeah. Yeah. right we mm -hmm. you know we don't actually see it but i think it's season one like q makes a you know a, i think a klingon woman appear on the bridge and it's like this just very like aggressiveness and you get a little bit of that in the laurel scene as well so so there's also the torchbearer armor which is yes awesome i'm glad uh, you like it, it. <laughs> it's amazing it's a, a major departure from established klingon looks what was this process like and what was the reaction to the work um well i think the vulcans and i know that wasn't the question but the vulcans are a perfect thing to reference in terms of deviation when you do a vulcan design you know about the ears being pointed and there's a certain mm -hmm. type of shape. It's not elfin and it's, it's Vulcan. Um, and then there's the brows and that's just hair growth, a pattern of hair growth. There's no physical application of makeup um, that changes their morphology. So what identifies a Vulcan? Well, it's the ears and the eyebrows and a haircut. Now we're saying that every Vulcan in the universe throughout all time they get one haircut, which is the bull haircut. And unfortunately, that's what identifies them. Like when you're doing a Vulcan character, you're going to do some version of that, that cut. And if you don't, and I did intentional designs with, you know, it's kind of floppy hair, um, what that would look like, a Justin Bieber hairstyle on a Vulcan. It's like, well, now it's Justin Bieber with Vulcan hairs. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I know. And that's an interesting problem with with iconography and canon. So when you're doing Klingons, 
do Klingons only wear a sash? Is that like that's the one thing that they must have? Is this what chainmail looking sash? Um, well, for a certain few movies and and series, that's that particular group of Klingons. So yes, it's uniform. This particular group of Klingons in Discovery, it's different. And then you can talk about Kelvin Klingons also being very different if you want. I love so, those Calvin Klingons. I just have to say, yeah. from Into Darkness. I oh, they were cool. The, the costume yeah, design was, was really smart. Um, but this was an opportunity to ign ignore, respectfully, that not every Klingon's going to have. You, you shouldn't have to. Uh, it, with when fashion is the choice, you shouldn't have to go. Ah, but the armor's going to need a sash because that's iconic of them. It's like I get it, but. This is just not them. The logo was even a push. Uh, it's like, would they have a Klingon logo? I mean, are we that? Are the Klingons uh, very much about that flag? So when the way that suit design was born cosmetically was when Brian first presented his images on the wall when I first, the day one of coming into the project. And he had pictures of samurai armor of uh i think there was a like a playboy mansion smoking room cognac and cigars and silk robes and uh museum imagery and brian was saying in summation i want the these clans to be sophisticated they appreciate the arts they appreciate good food wine mahogany uh, you know it's like all those things i'm listening to it going god why not that's kind of cool stuff so i ran with that because he had a, a bunch of different imagery. And I think that, for me, planted the seed of the idea. This is, again, why blue sky thinking is so important. The idea of a multicultural-looking piece of armor. I knew personally that whatever I designed and whatever we built with alchemy, that this should attempt to look like something you would find in a European museum, standing next to the French armor and the Spanish armor, it would have that level of, of museum quality um, elegance and sophistication to the surfacing. That was a goal, a personal goal. And the only way I was going to be able to achieve that was using contemporary 3D technology of both sculpting it this way and uh, 3D printing. Because of that, the tools and the time frame, I knew that I had an opportunity to be able to do something visually special in execution. I didn't know what it was going to look like yet. So th this is a complex story that I'll make very quick. The speed at which we were moving to get into production meant that the day we're shooting and the day we're starting this was getting so compressed with all the things that typically happen. You know, we're not done with the script. We're not quite ready yet. This date here is not changing when we're going to shoot. This is getting tight. So we got to the point where I had to be left alone. It was a rare moment for me where I said, I have to be left alone to design this suit and provide it to you unseen. You're just going to have to trust me because there's no time to go in and present iteration after iteration and evolution. Uh, so I'm going to start with the shoes. And I'll show you what the top of a shoe looks like and a shin guard. And if you like where that look is going, imagine the rest of him looking like oh, that that's because awesome. that's what you're going to get in a couple months. And it kind of had to go that way. There was a, a loose overall sculptural image I did that helped at least prepare you for what was to come. But literally, the day we did our first test fit, was the first time we all got to see it come together and the first time the actor who was performing it got to put it on and the first time the showrunners and executives got to come by and see it and there was no turning back all they got to do was go wow we like it that's going on camera or we hate it that's going on camera <laughs> it's like it is what it is <laughs> so i did feel confident that it was looking pretty cool but that does not mean anyone else would um it all worked functionally there's a few things i would like to change uh, of course but it actually he was the actor was able to like move his arm 
and do things. And I was like, okay, success, nothing is broken off. Uh, and everyone seemed to really like it. And then of course the proof in the pudding is it comes out, people see it. And the, the reaction was exactly what I had expected, which is what the hell is that? That's not a cling. It's like, it's not meant to be a Klingon. It is not meant to be, it's meant that a Klingon can fit inside of it. Um, but beyond that, it is meant to be a torchbearer, a very special um, uh, ceremonial suit. It's not there every day. This is a very particular individual, this, this particular look. Uh, and some loved it and some hated it. And in a way, that was good. Yeah. The, the loving and hating of the Klingon look wasn't the love hate you want to get the loving and the hating of the suit I felt was appropriate because it was a strong opinion. Uh, and again, just because one loves it doesn't mean it is right. It, it just, the, the strong opinion made sense on both sides. Um, but there's a whole another hour of, of dissertation about the torchbearer suit and the choices of aesthetics. And I, I think I mentioned in the book, and I may have mentioned this at Comic-Con just recently that it is a multiculturally inverse inspired aesthetic where I thought here's an opportunity to make a statement that the Klingons have been around for a long, long time. And it's ancient alien theory where they had come to this planet many years ago in that particular type of suit and parts of the planet resonated with what they're seeing on its head or resonated with what they're seeing on the shoulders or the shins. So when you take a real close look at the suit, there was an attempt at harmonizing all religious, well, a lot of religious iconography. So there's Thai Naga um, in it. There's Christian, there's Islamic, there's all this stuff that says the Klingons were here and different cultures picked up on certain aesthetic uh, motifs and that became their culture and their sort of religious iconography, um, including uh, the Christ-like on a cross, but upside down um, detail that created and inspired the Klingon logo, which there was never a backstory. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a reason for that Klingon logo? Um, so again, when I talk about the big red creature from Star Trek and saying there are reasons for everything. I cannot personalize design with choices that are, oh, I felt it should look like that because that's subjective. But if it's backed up with canon, franchise, IP, narrative rules, then all of a sudden you have a reason for it. And the Star Trek fans are the ones that all fans deserve it, but Star Trek fans demand it. Um, where don't just tell me what you think is right, Neville. I've been I've been embraced and dedicated to this show longer than you have. I need stuff that is Star Trek. So whenever we design for Star Trek, it has to be wearing the hat of having been a fan and, yes, servicing the fan base. Not in a uh, condescending way, but making sure that your fans yeah. love what you do. Yeah. That's, that's a goal. <laughs> it doesn't always succeed. Uh, I mean, listen, uh, I will be the first to admit when Discovery first on, it did not deter me from watching the show at all, but it it took me a minute when the Klingons first showed up. I was like, yeah, oh boy, okay. But I but I will also add on top of that, that even what other transgressions I may have had at the start, I always looked at that torchbearer armor and was like, well, holy crap, that is just a work of art. Like, it is oh, thank you. fantastic. So um speaking of, of of works of art let, let's move on to a, a different alien one that's become one of the most beloved characters in all of star trek right now talk about the original v-shaped head and multi-eyed design of saru and how and how budget cuts right kind of ended up being a blessing in disguise because sometimes budget cuts suck but in this situation maybe not so much well saru we knew was the most critical character because of the makeup and there was no person earmarked f to play that role. <clears throat> and, um, and Brian Fuller had an idea of a V shaped head and he did a, 
I don't know if that sketch ended up in the book. I hope. I think it did. But, I don't know if about the sketch, but I know that there's definitely like the look of it is in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I certainly took Brian's sketch almost verbatim and said, "Okay, if that's what you want, let me try and reconcile this this goal," because I always felt like that was one of those designs where I thought, "Damn, Brian, you keep throwing me these curveballs. This is a hard one to pull off." Forget about the technicalities of it. It was just like visually a V-shaped head, multiple eyes. Hmm. First of all, if we're talking about multiple eyes, I've done multiple eyes on variety of creatures from the big red to avatar where the creatures have multiple yes. eyes, but on avatar, it are multiple eyes made sense because some were a specific ocular sensory device and the ones in front were a different sensory and they look different as a, as a consequence. Redundant eyes um, you know, you got to have a justification for redundancy. And of course, the proximity of redundancy, if something gets injured, having another one over there doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. So, you know, you're trying to figure out how can I make this work? Because I really want Brian to get what he has asked for. And so I, I did my level best and um, it got approved as a direction, but we still needed an actor. And Glenn and I had a conversation about, well, they haven't proposed to us. Why don't we propose to them? And Glenn and I, I think without saying, because we did have a wonderful shorthand back in the day of knowing what each other was thinking. And we both knew that Doug Jones was possibly the only person that should play Saru. And of course, once that person plays that character, you can't imagine anyone else. No. It's like Zac Efron as Saru. <laughs> he would be amazing <laughs> as a performer, no doubt. But that's a whole different thing to imagine. Uh, and I do think Zac Efron is an incredible actor. Um. So I called up Doug because of my personal relationship with him and said, Hey, would you be interested and available to talk to the Star Trek peeps? Cause I would like to pitch you as this character. And he was busy on some water film with a guy named Guillermo. And I was like, ah, oh, whatever. That one. Yeah. That's not going to be any good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was touch and go quite a bit. Um, but we were, uh, we got him in, we did a test makeup of that makeup and it was good. Um, the guys at Alchemy at Glenn's shop did a really great job, beautiful sculpture, beautiful execution, smart details of like, which part do we have uh, be removable so that it's for comfort of eating and for doing a green screen effect, get rid of the nose, all those things, all very, very smart. And we did a post digital effect with Jason Zimmerman, the visual effects supervisor um, of getting the eyes to blink and costume was on and everything was tested. And we all thought amazing, but getting him in makeup and the post process, which isn't daunting. I mean, Doug did his character from falling skies, which was a ton of, of post digital work. So we know that it can be done. It just comes down to, like you said, what's the overall budget? Is that where you want to put your money? And so in the end, I was asked, um, is there anything, Neville, you can do to the design to make it more affordable? Like, can we get rid of the eyes? And so we were talking about it. It's like, well, yeah, if we got rid of the eyes, just had Doug's eyes. And then if we did this and got rid of that and changed, I said, I think we should just redesign it. <laughs> Let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. This time it makes sense. And let's reimagine it. So we spent months coming up with the V version of Saru. And now we had essentially a day and a half to come up with the new Saru in terms of design. And that was one of those classic moments of you can spend months on something and get nowhere and spend 24 hours on something else. It's like a Eureka. Yes. So if they gave us 24 hours at the beginning, <laughs> would it have been great? I don't know. But, but it worked out. At the very least, the design wasn't wasted. It was uh, then used in lower decks, which is probably a better use of it because uh, well, animation it is there. a lot easier to do. Yeah, than... it, it's more it's more accepting of a, a very peculiar design. But you know what? I did the same thing when we knew that we were going to not do the V shape. I called up Doug and I said, "Here's an opportunity for you." What do you, you've now worn that makeup? You've experienced it. What would you like Doug Jones as a design? And it can be, your answer can be from any point of view. You want it to be green versus blue. Um, you want it to have 
Uh, you want it to be really just Doug Jones, and we just do a couple simple things. Do you want to be completely buried like we had you in the V makeup? What do you want? Because you have to live in this, and I'm hoping that you're going to have to live in it for several years. And he was hoping, I think, the same. So how comfortable do you want to be? And Doug can handle a lot. Yes. Thank goodness it's Doug. I don't think that Zach Efron would have put up with it, but <laughs> Doug, Doug was able to put up with quite a bit. Um, but I didn't want him to like suffer <laughs> for, for yeah. the art. So he gave me his notes. I took them all into consideration and it was aligned with what our goals were a fast makeup to apply and take off, but something significant cosmetically. Um, and in the end we have our, Doug Saru that we have today. And the one thing that Glenn and I both wanted the most to accommodate Doug's goals as well was whatever he does underneath, it's happening on the makeup. So whether the shapes are big um, and you have to like work through it, act extra hard so the expressions show. Which is crazy um, how well he does that, by the way. Uh, he just, that's Doug, you know, yep. that's why he is the one that I immediately with Glenn thought of. He is the one that knows where pantomime and theatrics um, are just enough because it's in front of a camera and you yeah. can't go too far because then it becomes yeah. ridiculous. So he's, he's the perfect balancing act. So yeah, that, that one worked out um beautifully in every way and i'm very proud of how everyone in a microscopic time frame months to now days uh, it all came together quite well and and a successful makeup is not just what people see but it's the stuff you don't hear about which is doug being comfortable doug being able to do his job um and whomever it is doug or the other actors Sitting in the chair for a minimal amount of time, both getting the makeup applied and removed, the, those have to be, the bookends of the experience have to be considered as part of a successful makeup. Hey everyone, we hope that you enjoyed our sit down and part one of our interview with Neville Page. We had a blast chatting with him about J.J. Abrams' Star Trek films, his makeup work on those, and then leading into Discovery Season 1 the redesign of the Klingons, Saru, and so much more. Stay tuned for part two next week as we sit down again with Neville and talk about using complexion in makeups, his work on Picard season two, and so much more. That's coming your way next week. We will see you then.